Okay. Dr. K, okay na tayo mag-start? Good to go, sir. I'm currently at 220 participants, sir. Thank you. Sir Bobby, okay na sa'yo? Yep, it's a go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the PCSRS webinar sponsored by Medtronic, uh, entitled "Total Mesorectal Excision: Obtaining Quality, Inequality Amidst Adversity." Okay. So you can now uh, you can see or when you enter the sign in the webinar, you can see the house rules. So before anything else, so please make sure to go over with the house rules. Uh, be much needed during the uh, talk and after the process for asking questions after each of the speakers will have their um, talk. Shall we start with the national anthem? Again, good morning. I am Dr. Katiwalaan. I'll be moderating the entire session of our So, with uh, okay. Shall we start with a welcome address from the our very own uh, PCSRS Philippine Society of Colon and Rectal? Surgeon President, current President, Dr. Bobby Bandolon. Sir Bobby? I think the community, Sir Bobby. Oh, yeah. oh sorry about that. <laughs> the new abnormal. Thank you, Dr. Katiwalaan. Uh, in behalf of the Philippine Society of Colon Rectal Surgeons, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. So for today, we have arguably the three most notable colorectal surgeons in the country, as well as two foreign speakers who are also considered trailblazers in the field. I'm sure everyone is aware that we are being flooded with webinars left and right. So the PSCRS is not going to be left out will continue to contribute to the flood by giving relevant and practical web-based lectures. So I hope that you will learn a lot from this webinar and in the future webinars of the society. Before I end, the PSCRS would like to express its appreciation and gratitude to Medtronic for sponsoring this educational event. And of course, for the help of the telemedicine network of the Philippines. So I now turn you back to our moderator, Dr. Mike Katiwalaan. Thank you. Magandang umaga sa lahat. God bless you all. 
clear, Bobby? Okay. Can we flash the program of the of this webinar? Okay. So this morning, as Dr. Our, as our president, Dr. Bobby, have said, uh, we have a series of four lectures, three of which uh, is, are the pillars of the modern PCSRS uh, who become mentors of, our, of the new fellows. Uh, this will be the first uh, speaker Given by Dr. Robert Dr. Rojas and Dr. Monroy as the third speaker. Uh, this will be followed by a foreign speaker, Dr. Chong, and whom I will all the speakers will be introduced before their before their uh, lectures. And uh, if you have questions, you have avenues to send your uh, questions after each of the talk. You can either use the chat box or the question and answer box. Now, each of your questions will be uh, read or will be screened, and hopefully, we can entertain all or most of your questions. Uh, due to time limitations, we we will uh, we can we'll try our best to answer all of your or most of your questions. Okay. Shall we start with the uh, first lecture? Doctor, can you flash the slides for Doctor of oh, Doctor um, Robert Chang? Okay. The first lecture is a well-known and a past. President of RS, Dr. Robert Chang. He is a past chair, a chairman of um, one of the training program of colorectal, uh, colorectal program in Jose Reyes Memorial Center. He is an active consultant also with the same institution. The, pres the past president of Philippine Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons 2013 and 2014. Uh, one of the pillars of the Society of Colon Rectal Surgery. Our first speaker, Robert Chang. Dr. Robert? Yeah, thank you. We're still waiting for your slides. Good morning, po, sir. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, po, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to thank the organizing committee. Dr. Bobby, Carlo, Dr. Joboy for this kind invitation, and to our uh, sponsors, Medtronic, and also a warm welcome to our foreign speakers, Dr. Chong and Dr. Pawit. So this morning, I've been tasked to talk about uh, TNE, the open approach, and I think it's up to title it where it all began, because it's actually where everything began. It has been mentioned that among the three modalities currently being used in the treatment of rectal cancer, that surgery is the part that is most variable. In fact, as pointed out in this paper, even within a randomized controlled trial, it is the surgeon that cannot be controlled. When you talk about control, we're actually speaking about absence of a standard operation. As you can see from the different pictures below, you have rectal cancer resection specimens that look very, very different. So with this kind of non-standardized operation or when the surgeon factor could not be controlled, 
you will have a wide range of local recurrence you know, from a low of 15 to a recurrence cur rate almost approaching 50%. Okay. And this is what we fondly call the surgeon factor in the surgical management of rectal cancer. So talking about the surgeon factor, breakthrough came in the early 80s when in 1982, Bill Hill published a paper wherein for the first time, uh, local recurrence rate was brought down to single digits. And uh, his approach to rectal cancer surgery was based on a concept, a hypothesis to support this concept and operative objectives to carry out this hypothesis. And he called this operation TME or total mesorectal excision. So before we go to the actual video, I think it will be nice to talk about key issues in total mesorectal excision for the audience to better understand the concept and the surgeon. So the concept of TME began uh, by with this notion that extra rectal spread of the rectal cancer will first be confined within what he called a package or a mesorectal package. And in order to remove everything, the tumor and the extra rectal spread, total excision is the major priority. So this picture drawn by his secretary has become a very iconic image when you talk about rectal cancer surgery. And to support this concept, okay, he hypothesized that when you are careful in doing your surgery, the visceral mesentery of the hindgut can be totally excised. And if you do that, you will encompass the complete field of spread of all potentially curable rectal cancer. So to carry out this hypothesis, it is the objective of the surgery to remove a specimen that is intact, to encompass all fields of spread, a specimen that is untorn to minimize tumor spillage. So when you follow the principles of TME, what you will have is a reproducible specimen almost all the time. And little did he know that with this concept, thus began the path to standardization of rectal cancer surgery. So by definition, TME is the complete excision of visceral mesorectal tissue to the level of the levators. You know? Let us try to explain what this means. You know? Let's start from the bottom, right? You have to carry your surgery to the level of the levators, all right? This picture will show you a rectal cancer resection specimen showing you the anterior peritoneal reflection and for you to achieve complete excision, your dissection should be carried out down to the level of the levators. So in females, it should, it should be down to the posterior vagina and in males, almost up to the, behind the prostate. Okay. And after you have gone down to the levator level, the mesorectal tissues must be completely excised. Okay. By complete excision, we mean a specimen with an intact mesorectum, no irregularities on the surface, okay? If there are, it should be lesser than five millimeters in, in length, okay? No coning. And when you slide the specimen, they should look smooth. Okay. So, TME has now achieved the goal of standardized surgery for rectal cancer, okay? So there is a question of why is there a need standardized surgery. Well, if you follow the principles of HEAL, okay, the operative objectives of TME are very clear. The technique is uniform, all right, as the specimens will reveal, it can be replicated. And at the end of the surgery, there is a characteristic uh, shape or feature of the surgical specimen that we all fondly refer to as a buttock, uh, shaped appearance of the mesorectum. So with standardized surgery, you can now develop some method to evaluate your surgery as was done as done by Phil Quirk and colleagues at the University of Leeds 
and by Professor Nagtegal from the Netherlands. So with this evaluation method, first you can evaluate the performance of the surgeon okay, and provide feedback to the surgeon. Okay. So with this evaluation process, you can say the surgery is good or the surgery is poor. But more importantly, uh, in addition to saying you have done good surgery or you have done poor surgery, is the prognostic significance of the specimen. Good specimens have been shown to have good outcome in terms of local recurrence. And when you have poor surgery, you're almost, all, almost sure that more than half of your patients will develop a recurrence. Okay. So the surgeon now is responsible for the quality of the surgical specimen and the specimen is responsible for the outcome. And you can even draw a straight line to say that now for rectal cancer operation, the surgeon is directly responsible for the surgical outcome. Now I'm going to talk about uh, total mesorectal excision, the local experience. Uh, it was first performed in 2002 when I came back from Basingstoke. And we further developed with Drs. Monroy, Dr. Rojas, okay, to include minimally invasive approaches. I think it is important to know that whatever approach you, you should decide to choose, the operative objectives should be the same. Okay? That is the removal of an intact, an untorn specimen by a meticulous sharp dissection, and at the same time, preservation of the autonomic nerves. However, I'd like to note that in some instances, I've seen an unfortunate turn when it comes to minimally invasive surgery. Now, it has began to be a race to fewer scars. Who can produce the fewer scars? I can do it in five, you can do it in four, so on and so forth. And the focus has turned to the cosmetic outcome rather than the quality of surgery. And I have seen in more than one occasion that the documentation of the post-operative scar is favored over the quality of the resection specimen. And that is unfortunate. Now, I will, I will share with, with, with you my personal journey through introduction of TME and to the different approaches. I did it first in open. We were not the first to do it laparoscopic, but Dr. Rojas and I, were the first to do the first robotic TME in the Philippines. Now, through all these years, I've developed my own single incision approach. My approach provides excellent exposure. There's no problem with man bowel manipulation, no problem with vascular control. And this approach produced excellent quality of surgery and oncologic outcome. And I call this approach a laparotomy. So when you talk about open surgery, I believe it is the requisite basic training for TME. It is within the capabilities of most centers to perform. Of course, it's practical, okay? less operating time, no equipment, manpower issues. And of course, in a developing economy such as ours, economics is always, almost always an area of concern. So the operative technique, I will be uh, showing videos of two patients to highlight different phases of dissection. The first patient will highlight the abdominal part. The second patient will highlight the pelvic dissection. Okay. I will be utilizing a triple stapling technique as popularized by Brendan Moran. Okay. The first two staplers are linear staplers. The first staple line to include uh, the bowel, distal to the tumor, wherein we perform a distal washout, and a second stapler placed distal to the first after the washout, and we transect the bowel, and we uh, re reconstruct bowel continuity using an end-to-end -end stapled anastomosis. Okay. So I will be showing you a video. Now, uh, it is important to know that when you do open surgery, the right-handed surgeon stays on the left side of the patient. A left-handed surgeon stays on the right side of the patient. I think that is very, very important. 
Okay, so we start the video. Okay. If you will look at the timestamp in this video, it is 2004. This video was done 16 years ago. Okay. And of course, I have to give credit where credit is due. You can see that the surgeon is a right-handed surgeon with size 8 gloves. Those are the hands of Dr. Orlando Basilio when he was still with me. So I am doing the first assist part. Okay. So we start usually on the left gutter. Okay. Uh, as we all know, the intersigmoid fossa. After entering the peritoneum, the first structure you would encounter will be the gonadal vessels or what the obstetricians call the infundibulo pelvic ligament. It is not the ureter. Okay. However, in minimally uh, uh, invasive approach, okay, you start by looking for the ureter. That's one technical area we will discuss later in the open forum. Okay. Now, I'm teasing off here okay, the superior hypogastric plexus. That's the infundibulo pelvic or the gonadals. And you see the ureter is down there. right? It's in the layer be beneath the gonadal vessels. So that is the in inferior mesenteric artery. These are the nerve, okay? Superior hypogastric plexus. At this level, you don't see it bifurcating into a hypogastric left and right branch yet. After the left, we move to the right, okay? So again, if you follow the correct plane, what you will see what is what I call cobwebs, all right? Oh, sorry, what happened? Let's move it forward a little bit. Where are we? My apologies. Okay, again, so these are the nerves okay, that we tease off. So this is again the left side. Okay, so gonadal vessels underneath will be the ureter. All right. And then after finishing on the left, we go to the right, okay? Vessel, nerve, ureter. Okay, we move to the right, okay? As I was saying, if you maintain a correct plane, all you will see will be fibrous tissue or, or what I will call cobwebs, okay? Not much bleeding will be encountered. So on the other side, on the right side, you want to see the other end or the other side of the superior hypogastric plexus. Remember at this stage, there is no branching into the left and right hypogastric nerve. You can barely see the, the nerves here, no? A little bit of the nerves here. Please take note that the sizes of the nerves are very variable from patient to patient. All cobwebs, you know, all cobweb dissection, okay? Some vascular control. I'm just finishing the dissection to expose the inferior mesenteri mesenteric artery. Okay, so teasing off tissues to leave the other side of the superior hypogothic plexus. Intact, no? so nerve on the left side, nerve on the right side, okay? So you create a window between the nerve and the vessel. That is the first step to nerve preservation, okay? You create a window between this nerve and that vessel, okay? So, I usually at this point sacrifice my finger. Dr. Kahukom is very used to burning my finger all these years. Okay, this is Dr. Basilio doing the same. Okay. So you dissect up to the root of the inferior mesenteric artery. That's your window, a vascular, uh, that is in an, a vascular window showing the nerve nicely preserved and the vessel. Okay. Uh, this is 2004 video. I don't use mixtures to dissect anymore. Okay, try to isolate high ligation of the inferior mesenteric artery and vein. 
Okay, so that finishes the abdominal part. And now we move on to the pelvic part. This is another patient. Okay, it will be me doing the dissection. I'm left-handed. So we enter here, not here. Because if you enter here, you cut the nerves. You enter high up here. Okay. So that is me on the right side of the patient. Okay. You will see here the posterior part of the mesorectal fascia, or what Bill Hill calls the package. All right. And if you stay in the, in the right plane, all you will see will be cobwebs. And it's like you're peeling off the mesorectal fascia or the posterior rectum from the presacral structures. Okay. Everything is done sharp. This is the left anterolateral portion. This patient has a, had, is a female patient with a previous hysterectomy. So later on, you will see some scarring on the anterior portion. So again, it's peeling off the mesorectal fascia. We try to keep it untorn and intact and trying to dissect all the cobwebs away from the uh, rectum. Okay. Okay. As you can see, no? so everything, there's actually a plane, a covering, what we call the mesorectal fascia, enclosing all the tumor and the extra rectal spread. This now is the right side of the patient, right anterolateral. Okay. Almost the same. No? They look blended, but actually you can divide, you can go through that and create your plane if the traction is correct and the angle of the traction is correct. Okay. So this is the end product, hypogastric nerve, nervi erigentes on the pelvic side walls. Okay. So hypogastric nerve and then anterior we will see as a posterior. Now, you can see this patient had a previous hysterectomy. This anterior portion is all scarred up. Again, you try to peel off the mesorectal fascia and the posterior rectum from the lateral attachments. As you can see in this dissection, there's no such thing as lateral stops. I do not believe in lateral stops. Okay, anyway, it's the end of the dissection. This is a very old TA stapler. First stapler, this Salwashal, second stapler. This is 2004. Uh, TA came, I think, 2005 or 2006 because I've been asking for the, for the company to, to please have TA45 available in the country. So this is the TME dissection, okay? This is the scarred portion of the upper vagina. It's not the tumor. So a complete intact specimen, okay? Intact anterior, this is the scarred upper vagina, not the tumor, okay? So everything is okay. Oh, this is a, an old technique that I have abandoned ever since, but I think it would be nice to show. This is a transverse coloplasty, okay, that will take the place of a J pouch. Okay. I used to do that for a while, okay, but it's nice to show some historical techniques that I have abandoned. Okay. But some still use it. Transverse coloplasty, okay, this is the uh, stapler into Drus through the anus, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is a stapler introduced through the anus. Okay, and then an end-to-end -end anastomosis. And again, 2004 video, 2004 instrument, okay, that's no longer in use, all right? And then after that, you perform your end-to-end -end anastomosis and we'll, most of the time we'll divert with a lupiliostomy. So specimen and then air insufflation test just to check, but we still perform a uh, lupiliostomy to divert the anastomosis, to protect the anastomosis. So after the operation, what is key is to have two complete donuts, as you can see here, and an air insufflation test that is negative. 
But that doesn't mean that with a ne negative earnings situation test, we do not protect. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm still evolving, but I, I on occasion, do not protect my low anterior sections. So this is the last of my slide, just to show you the operative objective has been achieved, that is to remove a complete and untorn specimen. So with that, I would like to end my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Back to you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for that very detailed uh, video and a step-by-step -step description of what is TME, okay? So, so questions will be entertained after all the lectures again. So you can, uh, the, the attendees can send their questions to a different platform, which, be, which will be the chat box and the Q and, Q and question and answer box that you can find in your screen below. Okay, so the next speaker that will share to us uh, his expertise will be my mentor, Dr. Manuel Francesco Rojas. He is a clinical associate professor of the Department of Surgery in the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. He is a past chairman of the Division of Colorectal uh, surgery training program in the U UPPGH and past president of the Philippine Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons. He's a senior consultant in the medical, the medical city and currently a member of the Board of Regents in the Philippine College of Surgeons. Dr. Rojas, good morning po. Sir, nakamute po kayo, sir. Thank you very much, Mike, for your kind introduction. Um, let me just share my screen. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers uh, of this uh, webinar. Um, when when Joe Boy invited me to participate last week, um, I was a little uh, hesitant because I said, you know, when I watch all these webinars, it's you guys, the younger guys who are giving the lectures now. And I notice uh, uh, Professor Strong and Pawit are, are here and are of that age group. And I said, if you invite me, uh, I tend to wax historical. And he said, it's all right. And then when I saw that um, Robert Chang and Nodeng Manori were part of it, then uh, I got kind of excited because this is like a, a walk through uh, history all over again, particularly our journey to TN. So let me start the lecture um, with the objectives. The objective is, uh, number one, to appreciate the historical developments of lap TME, to describe the techniques of lap TME, and to understand the present benefits and limitations of lap TME. Um, when he came out with his uh, pivotal paper in 1982, it took almost uh, 17 years before it gained worldwide uh, acceptance and recognition, uh, particularly with the tripartite consensus conference with the definition of what TME really was. And uh, actually in 2013, they came up with a textbook that uh, I think all of us rectal cancer surgeons should have a copy of. And they talked about the fundamental principles of TME, which is a very mesorectal holy plane dissection, specimen-oriented surgery and histopathology, personal and pathologic audit, preservation of autonomic plexuses and nerves, a major increase in anal preservation and reduction in the number of permanent colostomies, and stapled low pelvic reconstruction or hand-sewn coloanal anastomosis. Uh, Brendan Moran, his close associate, also talks about, and I think Robert uh, shows this rather nicely, being specimen-oriented and always aware of the circumferential appearance of the, of the specimen. And I think that's key, and that's where standardization uh, comes about. 
I, I finished my fellowship in 1996. At that time, and, and Robert came shortly after me, but at that time, there was no theater in the country. And uh, actually, our first forays into rectal advanced rectal cancer management was with neoadjuvant therapy because the Swedish rectal cancer trial with short course radiotherapy versus no radiotherapy uh, for low anterior resection had just come out in 1997. This was followed by the Dutch rectal cancer where they added TME to the short course radiotherapy trial. But if you notice, we were still in, 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 our, in our country just focusing on neoadjuvant therapy. And then of course the German rectal cancer trial in 2004 um, Focus on long course radiotherapy plus TME. And this is where we started uh, looking at the phenomenon of complete pathologic response, which we had not really seen uh, prior to long course radiotherapy. Um, and it's funny because even as we were looking at the literature and moving into uh, neoadjuvant therapy, it was only in 2001 when we started doing endorectal ultrasound because of the sudden availability of our of our ultrasound machine. So it's funny how uh, prior to, to this, uh, we would we would make a judgment on neoadjuvant therapy without ultrasonography or MRI. But uh, certainly um, this brought into picture, uh, the advent of uh, ultrasound brought into the picture the need for accurate pre-operative pre-treatment staging for planning out any treatment. And it was only in 2002, 2004, where we started looking at TME. And, it, and Robert himself was the first one to go to Basin Stokes, I think in 2002. And then we, we went back together in 2004 and came back uh, uh, motivated and, and inspired to try to bring TME to the country. But while this was going on, um, and, and we were still trying to master our techniques in TME, open TME, and, and ultrasonography, and planning for neoadjuvant therapy, at the same time, laparoscopy was starting to take root, uh, particularly for colon surgery. And, and so within this period, with the various reports and studies, it became, it became more and more clear that uh, laparoscopic colon uh, cancer surgery had less post-operative pain, less pain related to complications, less wound complications, faster bowel function recovery, early ambulation, recurrence and survivals being similar. And it, I, I remember still being caught in that era where there was a question initially of port site recurrence and when I visited the Mayo Clinic at the time, and that must have been in 1997, um, they were doing, they had stopped doing laparoscopic colon only because of the reports of, uh, of um, port site recurrence. They were awaiting the results of the uh, randomized trials uh, and therefore would not do any additional cases until those results came out. And they did come out. There was no increased risk for port site recurrence, which opened the floodgates for laparoscopic colon surgery, as we know it. Um, of course, it's a different picture with laparoscopic TME. And it's interesting to note here that the first reports on laparoscopic TME came from Asia, specifically the, uh, the uh, group of uh, Michael Lee. And... Uh, and of course, uh, I was watching our colleagues in the rest of Asia from uh, Korea, Japan, uh, move faster in the area of laparoscopic total mesorectal excision, perhaps even faster than their Western counterparts. So um, I took my first workshop in Singapore and then in Hong Kong at the 2000. But really, uh, we were pioneers in one sense in the country because um, there was no one else in the country to teach us. Uh, the machines weren't optimum, the tables weren't optimum, and our assistants really had no background on how to, to assist us in, in these operations. So it was a, a very long and slow climb as we tried to get our experience up in laparoscopy. 
I'll show to you now um, what happened. In 2007, we institutionalized the rectal cancer program when I took in, uh, in the Philippine General Hospital when I became the, the chief. And in, by institutionalizing it, we standardized OPEN and the uh, TME, uh, uh, multidisciplinary pre-treatment planning with medical oncology and radiation oncology, new adjuvant short course or long course radiotherapy based on the MDT discussions, pathologic and MDT audit, and of course, laparoscopic colorectal surgery. And so on, on the left of my slide, you'll see the APR rates going down from 2006 at the high 50% going down to just less than 15% by 2011. And, and the paper right below on the left shows how sequence of planning changed frequently with MDT discussion. So we were trying to prove that MDT was worthwhile because prior to that, uh, each, each unit and our surgery in particular would just do what they, they wanted. Um, we also instituted our laparoscopic colorectal surgery program and I have to really give credit to Michael Lee who would come often to our hospital to assist us in the program. And that's me uh, in the middle with Michael Lee on the right in blue and Noning Monroy on the left uh, doing one of the cases uh, with Michael Lee. So we institutionalized the uh, laparoscopic program and this is the, the data that uh, the Philippine General Hospital has from 2012 to 2019. And if you notice, uh, MIS is roughly a third of the cases. Majority are still done open. Uh, there's a few cases from the Robert which they acquired uh, late last year, but majority are laparoscopic. Um, this is the data combining both colon and rectum, and you can see that since 2012, the number of our cases has grown. Uh, many of these uh, cases are done by our fellows. We have increased, we increased the training program of our fellowship in colorectal surgery from a year to two years, really to, to facilitate the training of their laparoscopic uh, skills. Let's look at the current evidence now on lab -E. And I'm just going to focus on the latest uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis uh, out there. Uh, this one from Italy, from uh, Martinez Perez and his group, uh, published in 2017. And I thought I'd just uh, put this out there. You know. uh, in their meta-analysis, uh, they showed that there was no difference in circumferential resection margins uh, with a trend favor favoring, though, uh, open uh, rectal resections. They also pointed out that laparoscopic rectal resections had more non-complete mesorectal excision, raising the question of whether laparosco laparoscopic rectal resections had a superior benefit in terms of uh, long-term cancer outcomes. Now you have to understand when they, they, they put non-complete here, they were lumping incomplete and near complete together. So in this uh, other analysis uh, published in 2016 uh, um, from China in Keshen's group, uh, if you look at the, uh, the graphs on the right, they had, of course, uh, slightly better distal resection margins with laparoscopy, similar circumferential resection margins, and similar lymph node harvest. Of course, we know uh, laparoscopy has longer operative time, less overall complications, so shorter post-operative hospital stay and less blood loss. And I think uh, there's, no, no, there's no question about that already. Um, when they did look at um, cancer survival, whether it's three or five years, there was no difference in overall survival, uh, disease-free survival and local recurrence in three years. Uh, for five years, there was no difference in overall survival, uh, disease-free survival, local and distal recurrence, uh, perhaps with a better trend for over-survival in lab, but not significant. And then I'd like to, to cite this paper just published last year by Yung Mio Son, talking about the data on laparoscopic team and team. And they, they entitled it, Reconsiderations of the Safety of Laparoscopic Rectal Surgery for Cancer. And um, 
if you look here, they've segregated complete, nearly complete, and incomplete uh, between the various uh, multicenter uh, um, uh, randomized trials. But you, I think you should also note that it appears that the, uh, if you look at the p-values, the, the results are ambivalent. And if you look at long-term outcomes, you have either no significant differences with the Korean and color trials and significant differences in the classic uh, trials. Um, so, the, so the results are ambivalent in terms of long-term outcomes and we really have to we really we really have to wait for the data to mature when it gets to uh, long-term outcomes for laparoscopy. Although I have to admit, for many of us in the audience who do laparoscopy, um, well, we, we do it anyway because we, we feel that uh, judging the specimens that we remove, that they are still comparable. So anyway, I just thought I'd bring it out that uh, uh, for, long, for, for local recurrence and the disease-free survival, this paper by Gyeong Mo Son, uh, points out that incomplete PME, of course, was associated with unfavorable outcomes, but there was no significant difference between complete and near complete PME. And that is where I think, for those of us who do these procedures, the, the crux lies. Is there a difference in outcomes, whether our specimens are as good as what we can get when it's open or not as good, but near complete? Uh, we're still not certain whether near complete PME is an oncologic threat with unfavorable outcomes. However, the, the second paper I showed you does seem to show that there doesn't seem to be a difference. They also pointed out that the learning curve for lab PME is between 60 to operate 80 operations. And, um, and I guess that's also part of the message we're sending. Um, whether you're going to get a complete PME or a near complete PME or God forbid an incomplete PME really depends on your skills. And uh, that has to be taken into consideration also. I just like to point out some limitations of lab PME uh, that we encounter here in, in my country. I pointed out the steep learning curve with small margins of error. Uh, although, you know, as I was uh, mulling through this, uh, these papers and this presentation, uh, if we have to be stringent about our quality uh, for lab PME, uh, just the same, we have to be stringent about the quality of open PME. And, and, and the learning curves for open PME should also be something we need to address. Of course, uh, lab PME is more difficult with locally advanced tumors that are bulky or T4. Um, we, we tend to think twice before doing a stage four disease with resectable metastases uh, or with multivisible resections. Obese males with narrow pelvises are always a challenge, uh, which is why we welcome the advent of other techniques like robotics and PAPME. Difficult post-op additions uh, are always a challenge, whether open or laparoscopic, but more so laparoscopic, but um, many times uh, we will lie sedations laparoscopically when we enter. Even for robotics, we have to lie often with uh, laparoscopy if there are lesions. Uh, and then also, uh, the issue about lap PME is also compounded by, by the availability of other treatment options. Complete pathologic response in the watch and wait uh, option with, with or without local excision. Open robotic or TAPME, depending on the status of the patient as well as the um, capabilities. Uh, we have a Z benefit package for our patients in the National Field Health Insurance Program. But that, in my experience in, in private practice, does not make ruposcopic uh, uh, PME. And then, of course, training requirements, because uh, if, our, if, our, if our, our trainees need to learn open very well, and they should, if they have to learn laparoscopic, perhaps the PME and robotic in the future, how do you spread the experience uh, around so that they get enough of the cases done? So 
these are things we still have to to struggle through. Uh, certainly, when we teach our, our residents uh, and our fellows lab P and E, we find, we like to break it down into phases. And uh, when they assist me uh, and they watch me do it, I also am assessing whether they can proce proceed to the next phase uh, um, um, and, and do it and do it uh, themselves. Um, you have to understand also uh, for many of our fellows who enter the program, our fellow trainees, uh, oftentimes their, their experience with laparoscopy is just uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And so their ability to assist in, uh, in colorectal laparoscopic procedures uh, needs to be also um, uh, enhanced, whether it be first assist or, or uh, camera work. So we start off with the mediolateral dissection uh, and uh, coming from the, the period of open PME, it was such a, um, well, a learning experience for us to be able to see what was underneath the mesocolon and the mesorectum um, and, 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 and to be able to look at, look at the specimen from all angles now, that which, which laparoscopy allowed us to do. Um, so ligation of the IME, IMV, and dissection up to the line of thought, after which lateral dissection and splenic flexure mobilization uh, is the next step that we uh, progress them to. And I'll show you a video here. So, so uh, we're starting the medial to lateral dissection here. Um, and we're using both a ligature and a cautery. It's nice to use a cautery because if you're in the right plane, they just fall away. I have to say though that I like using the ligature myself, um, particularly if your assistants aren't very good at it yet, because it does facilitate the process. You know, many times these beautiful uh, videos that you see on on the net uh, are the work of a team, a really good team with good assistants, a good cameramen. And that's not often the uh, situation when we're dealing with our trainees in actual cases. So here we mobilized, we've ligated the IMA, the, the IMV, and I, I ligate the IMV if I know it's going to be a very low anastomosis, and then we mobilize the uh, splenic flexure. Uh, for a very low anastomosis, I also uh, separate the uh, mesocol, uh, the momentum from the uh, uh, transverse colon and, and, and bring bring down the, the splenic flexure after that. The next uh, step in teaching lap PME is fully plain PME in the pelvis down to the levators and the bare rectal cuff. And of course, we start with the posterior dissection, moving on to the lateral dissection and the anterior dissection, preserving the bilateral hypogastric nerves, the bilateral inferior hypogastric plexuses, as well as the, of course, seminal vesicles, prostate, and the periprostatic plexus. Um, here's a diagram of the uh, hypogastric nerves in the upper, left upper. And you can see on the image below, and I think Robert has shown that already in his video, uh, how, how this can be preserved uh, and, and visualized rather way with laparoscopy. The trick really is in, in the male. Uh, not just because of a more narrow pelvis, but more so because of the, the structures uh, anteriorly. And um, the uh, hypogastric nerves, as you know, uh, merge with the sacral nerves laterally to form the inferior hypogastric plexus, which then, then move anteriorly. And they are most at risk for injury if you um, dissect anterior to the non biliary fascia. So unless your tumor is anterior, so for posterior and, and smaller tumors, it's best to enter uh, the anterior plane um, posterior to the non biliary fascia. And, and the images here will show you that imprint of the non biliary fascia and where you should, and where you should enter. Uh, if you enter uh, just below it, then you're in the right plane and you have less risk for your uh, uh, periprostatic plexuses. 
sometimes you do, and I do with bulky tumors, have to enter. Uh, so here you're, you're watching it below the denonvirus here. This is above, the denonvirus here. The dissection is above. But for bulky tumors, I tend to take the non villiers fascia videos. The video, the video is going to show the pelvic dissection. Um, uh, you're seeing here, the, this is a female, right? and uh, you're seeing uh, the posterior uh, lateral dissection, and we're just following like what Robert showed, the, the cobwebs, keeping the uh, mesorectum intact. Um, and uh, moving laterally then anteriorly. So not as much problems with the female. You can see the mesorectum end of it here and you're entering the, uh, the end of the mesorectum is here. So you're here with the bare rectal cuff. And that's really, and your levators are here at the end. And that's really the end of our dissection. And uh, a complete TME is done there. And I have to say from my turn, we, we could not see the end of the bare rectal cup as well as we as we, we could with open uh, compared to laparoscopy. So laparoscopy allowed us to really see the end of the bare rectal cup. And I have to say, having done a lot of open myself, even even the strain on my hands was uh, was less with laparoscopic TME. Uh, after after that, uh, the last step uh, in our teaching of lap PMEs, the transection and anastomosis, and it can either be done uh, via stapled intracorporeal anastomosis, if, if you've been able to mobilize the tumor and, and get to the the, the uh, levators. Um, I, 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 I always uh, remove my specimens for a fan and steel incision in the hypogastrium, and uh, even that is a skill that the, the fellows have to, to, to learn and keep doing. Um, stapling. Uh, getting the anvil uh, down to the, uh, the sharp point of your circular stator is also a skill that uh, you can get impatient with your fellows, but that's something they, they need to practice and to master. And then, of course, if you want a, if you need to do a colloidal anastomosis with the interstitial dissection, specimen extraction, and the hands-on anastomosis, that's also something uh, we need to, to train our fellows on. Uh, of course, laparoscopic PME is still specimen-oriented surgery with uh, strict circumferential awareness. So I, I think uh, this is the end of my talk. In summary, laparoscopic PME is an important skill in the surgical armamentarium for rectal cancer. Um, but it's not the only skill. Uh, it has a steep learning curve. Standardization and audit of technique is essential. And surgeons must adapt, must be adept in the various modalities uh, because uh, patients present themselves in various situations. Sometimes it's better to open. Many times laparoscopy is a good option, particularly if they're willing to, to share, shell out a little more. Um, robotics and uh, TAPME will be discussed later. As we become more aggressive with, with with advanced disease and stage four disease and multivisceral resections, um, that has to be also part of the armamentarium of a of a rectal cancer surgeon. So, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd like to pass on the the um, the floor to the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Rami for that uh, very informative talk. Uh, now, we, I have seen a few questions already from our chat and q answer box. Thank you for sending those questions. And I encourage to, to so all or uh, the panel or the attendees to send your questions so that we can have a pool of questions after the talk of the speakers. Okay, thirdly, we have the, the next a speaker is still one of my mentor uh, who will talk on TME robotic Dr. Hermogenes Monroy is of the Department of Surgery in the Philippines College of Medicine. He is the current chief 
of the Division of Colorectal Surgery of the Philippine General Hospital. He's the assistant head for operations for PGH COVID-19 Task Force and Hospital Surgical Services. Uh, can we welcome the third speaker, Dr. Hermogenes Noning Monroy III? Sir Noning? Thank you, Mike, for uh, the introduction and uh, I'd like to thank the society for giving me this privilege to speak about robotic approach in rectal cancer surgery, the early experience at the Philippine General Hospital. And this webinar has really become an international symposium, having uh, international faculty and also participants. So robotic surgery, we, know, we all know the advantages and also the disadvantages. It's a 3D stereoscopic vision with wristed instruments, more stable platform for the camera and the instruments, involves shorter learning curve when compared to laparoscopic TME, better ergonomics for the surgeon, and has really provided solutions to the limitations of laparoscopy, particularly in laparoscopy having a straight um, instrument, and therefore more advanced procedures like uh, suturing, lateral lymph node dissection, and even excenteration have been done through robotic, which is will be very difficult uh, doing in laparoscopic. So really the main disadvantage is the prohibitive cost. We acquired our system cost of $2.5 million. And also most studies have shown it is a longer operative time. And there's also this lack of haptic feedback or sensation, but the last two disadvantages have, uh, have been addressed by experienced and skilled surgeon. This is from Intuitive. In 2019, um, a million, more than a million procedures were performed robotically, and there were additional 1,100 systems installed globally. So right now there are five. 1,500 robots in different hospitals in the world, 800 of which is in Asia. We have three in the Philippines. And the trend is that it's growing, particularly in general surgery, specifically in colorectal surgery. And this was brought about, as you can see, uh, general surgery has the deepest growth, followed by urology and gynecology. The recent um, gr significant growth was brought about by introduction of the fourth generation robot, the Vinci XI, introduced in the second quarter of 2014. As you can see in the darker blue graphs, bar bars, uh, these are the procedures done in XI compared to the lighter blue or aqua done using the system, SI system. And I think um, many colorectal surgeons have started embracing it, particularly in the United States, and also the colorectal trainees. I would just uh, like to cite uh, probably the most recent evidence in the literature when it comes to um, robotic TME. This is a paper published in World Journal of Gastrointestinal Oncology by Katie Jones et al. Included 28 studies, including the only single published uh, trial, randomized control trial, which is the ROLAR trial. This is robotic TME uh, meta-analysis that included 5,547 patients and look at the different operative outcomes and oncologic outcomes. I will just summarize the results and conclusion. 
this meta-analysis failed to show a statistically significant difference in robotic TME versus laparoscopic TME in all oncologic outcomes, which are local recurrence, CRM positivity, overall survival, and also no difference in most operative outcomes, except for shorter time to flatus for robotic TME, lower conversion rate, shorter hospital stay also for robotic TME, but there's a longer operative time for robotic TME. Another study published in American Journal of Surgery in 2018 showed that higher volume um, hospitals that do uh, robotic assisted colorectal surgery will lead to improved clinical outcomes, including operative time, length of stay, conversion rate, and even total direct costs. They classified, defined here as a high volume hospital for those doing more than 30 robotic colorectal in a year. But I think the best not really an evidence, but motivation that I got in going into robotic surgery was when I went to the creator of TME or the originator of TME himself, Professor Bill Hill, um, last February before the pandemic uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. And this is a robotic course, three-day robotic course and a two-day symposia on rectal cancer. He personally told me that robotic surgery will be the future for rectal cancer surgery. And in fact, he invited the guy on the left, Professor Amjad Parvis, to be head of the um, MIS colorectal in Champalimol Cancer Center, which uh, Professor Hill is now the chair, to do robotic surgeries for most of the rectal cancer cases. Professor Parvis is one of the leading robotic surgeons in the United Kingdom, and he, Professor Hill invited him to join him in Lisbon. So I'd just like to share our very early experience in PGH. Uh, I was fortunate to be trained back in 2012 to go, together with Marco Azores, um, by St. Luke's when St. Luke's Medical Center when they acquired a SI robot system. Um, but I was able to do just two cases in a span of two years after the initial training, mainly because I was just starting practice in that center and that uh, I was also still in the learning curve of laparoscopic colorectal surgery. And so in March 2019, um, our SI robot arrived in PGH and the first case was done. And this was only after two years of the very slow government procurement process. We, wa we wanted to get the XI, but the distributor would not allow us because of the high demand globally for XI system. And these are the different subspecialties formed to do robotic surgery in PGH. So we have the SI system, of course, the robotic instruments. So I have to go back to square, square one when it comes to training in robotic surgery. I have to do, again, the online module, simulations, wet lab training. I have to go to uh, Korea University Anam Hospital together with um, one of the ex-robotic experts, Professor Han, Sean Han Kim supposed to be a speaker in our canceled convention last April. So I was able to observe two rectal cancer cases and then went back for team training together with the staff, anesthesiologists, and also our fellows. Uh, learned about troubleshooting and plan to achieve or overcome the learning curve through online courses, simulation, and I think the most important is proctorship in your first few cases. So we were fortunate to have our Phil American colorectal surgeon from George Washington University, Vince, 
Obias, who gladly assisted us or proctored our us, you know, first two cases together with Dr. Lopez. So from March 2019 to March 2020, uh, there were two attending or two consultants that were trained or did the rectal cases. Majority were charity patients. And we did 31 TMEs for rectal cancer. So these are the demographics, average age of 57, mean BMI of 23, good risk patients, majority were males. Most patients were low rectal cancer. And the preoperative or the clinical staging, most are stage three patients. That's why majority also receive long course, a few receive short course and 16% did not receive any neoadjuvant treatment. So most of the procedures done were LARs and coloanal, followed by 23% um, APR. So mostly males, locally advanced disease, needing, needing neoadjuvant treatment, low-lying lesion, and most procedures done were sphincter preserving. So we monitored the uh, different intraoperative parameters like positioning time, docking time, consult time, and the total operative time, which was quite long because of the learning curve. Our first half of patients were done hybrid, meaning we did the splenic flexure mobilization and the intracorporeal anastomosis laparoscopically. But in the last few cases, we were able to do um, uh, all uh, robotically. So we monitored for trends. As you can see, there was initial trend to decrease operative time and even blood loss, but um, there were some outliers. And in the last few cases, we asked our fellows to do the docking, insertion of trocars, and even consult time. So we had Three patients converted due to different reasons. One stapler malfunction, one atrial fibrillation intraoperatively, and one acute colonic ischemia. But take note that this uh, conversion were uh, made after uh, completing the TME or the pelvic dissection. So all patients that we did, we were able to complete the TME robotically. So this is the post-operative mean post-operative length of stay, six, total length of stay of nine days. We have three post-operative ill use, one UTI, one anastomotic leak, 4.1% leak rate, one stoma necrosis in an APR, one intra-abdominal fluid um, retention, which we thought initially thought was abscess, but turned out to be just fluid, and there was no mortality. So our CRM positivity was 9.7%. Uh, so it was uh, R0 for 90% of cases. And we have the complete pathologic response in 16% of the cases. So our gross uh, assessment for the TME quality, 25 were complete out of the 31. And there was concordance with the pathologic evaluation. So limb nodes were adequate, margins, proximal, and distal were also adequate. Um, these are just a rough estimate of the cost in PGH for the patient or charity or service patient. The cost uh, Patients out of pocket will usually be around 10,000 pesos. The rest will be subsidized by the hospital. For the private patient, it can range to 120 to 200,000 pesos out of pocket from the patient without the professional fees. So with the professional fees, it can reach up 300, 350,000 pesos. So just sharing a video of one of the few cases, first few cases that 
with uh, deed. So this is a 40-year-old male with a six centimeter lesion post chemo RT. This is our setup in our robotic room. So steps are divided into different phases. Preparation, abdominal phase, pelvic phase, specimen structure, and then anastomosis. Patient positioning is very important to avoid any injuries. So for most of the cases, we use a breast needle because usually it is the camera is not placed in the umbilicus. It's usually three centimeter above and lateral to your umbilicus. So we insufflate with the rest. And then uh, after insufflation, that's the only time you mark your trocar sites using uh, rulers at least eight to 10 centimeter apart, the trocar sites. And then we insert our camera port with an optiport for safety. And then, of course, camera guided, we place the robotic ports, 8 millimeter robotic ports. The robotic port has a remote sensor center, which should be at the level of your abdominal wall and should be placed with uh, just enough incision to avoid leak and moving of the trocars. So it should be placed perpendicular to your abdominal, the skin and abdominal wall for better movement. And then one or two assistant parts are placed. This is that we do side docking around 45 degrees to the operating table. And then after um, positioning, then we go to the, the surgeon goes to the console and do the dissection. So we, the steps of dissection should be similar to the laparoscopic PME. Um, start with medial to lateral dissection. Just making sure that we are just below the plane of your superior hemorrhoidal artery. And then um, going back to the uh, IMA. So this is your IMA, we legate IMA, then IMB. We use, usually use Hemolox. So I usually cut with a ligature for double security, this is your IMV. So basically same step as you do in laparoscopy, do your medial to lateral dissection, identify the ureter, but sometimes you're in the correct plane, uh, no need to worry about the ureter. So do your lateral dissection, and then identify the left ureter again because you can injure the ureter when you do your lateral dissection. So probably skip some of the video. Do a lateral dissection up proximally. So this is the pelvic dissection posterior. So as you can see the the shears or the instrument has two joints that can articulate and conform precisely with the specimen that you're dissecting. I think that that's one of the main advantages, robotics. So one here and one near the tip, the two joints.
So um, initially we did the stapling uh, laparoscopically, but after a uh, good number of cases, we did it um, robotically. So most of the cases we protect or do a diverting ileoproximal diverting ileostomy. And we extract the, the specimen in the umbilicus or midline. So just quickly, here's another case of a male patient post-chemo post RT. As you can see with this case, uh, this is one of our uh, late, most recent cases. We were able to do it probably better and completely robotics, under robotics. I'll just go to the pelvic dissection. So this is a difficult case because it's patient is male and preoperatively as a big tumor. So you expect some fibrosis uh, from the previous tumor site. You can use your energy device if you encounter some vessels in the ligament. Personally, with limited experience, I think I can, I'm more confident to perform or finish the TME completely with, with robotic approach compared to lab. Anteriorly, I usually cut uh, a centimeter above the peritoneal reflection. So that's already the bare rectal cuff below the, almost below the prostate. Very difficult to do a laparoscopic approach in a male patient in most cases. And this is better facilitated uh, with the robotic, robotic technology. I'll pass forward so you can see the elevators. I'll just show you this is the retrosacral ligament, which should be dissected or cut to really free your. Um, rectum and mesorectum, and this is anastomosis or cutting with the doc, the robot still duck. So I think we had we had a better specimen for this case. So in summary, robotic TME is feasible and safe in a local government setting. Cost and longer operative times are the main drawbacks. Can be mitigated with increase in experience and excellent surgical skills. Robotic TME I think is very promising and may well be indeed the standard in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noneng. Uh, indeed, this is a this webinar is attended by other our foreign delegates or attendees from our neighboring Asian countries and also Dr. Obias Sernoning is in the house. It's Thank you, Vin. Attending also. 
Okay, so we're still on time. We'll be proceeding to the fourth lecture uh, by a foreign speaker, Dr. Chong Chun Seng from consultant of the division in Singapore in a, also the Division of Surgical Oncology and National University Cancer Institute in Singapore. Here we will hear Dr. Chong to, to enlighten us and give us a talk on the newest uh, uh, method of TME, which is the transanal approach. Good morning, Dr. Chong. Hi, thank you so much, Chairman. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I shall start to share my screen first. I hope you are seeing my screen. Okay, and I'm putting out PowerPoint. Yes, okay. Yes, so uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, Dr. Bendalone, Dr. Chang, Dr. Raka, uh, Ogdes. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, it's a privilege to be here to be standing amongst really giants. And uh, I, I would really love to say thanks to uh, this, uh, this invite. And uh, I, I'm here to share about TATME, uh, although it's said to be a new uh, surgery or approach, but it has been around for really more than a decade. And indeed, uh, most of us are still exploring this field where it's pretty much full of controversies. So I don't have disclosures, except the fact that I'm being a good friend to some of the organizers. It's uh, good to see you all on the webinars. <laughs> uh, and indeed, uh, this just reminds me of... Uh, all the great people, the beautiful places that we've all shared and been to. And of course, don't forget the good food. So hope, hope that all of you are staying well and healthy. Hopefully we can see each other again once uh, the COVID blows over. So these are the contents of my talk. It's, uh, I'm just going to quickly cover uh, the concept of TATME and uh, the way that we do it in Singapore, some tips and tricks that we do. And uh, because the topic of my talk is about hype and hope. So I'll cover a little bit about a local and global adversity that TAT, TATME community face uh, currently and how we deal with it in, in Singapore. Finally, just a little bit about impact of COVID. So uh, because uh, Joe was telling me that I try to go on a little bit of video heavy, so I, I won't put up too many uh, articles, but I will just briefly talk about the concepts of TATME. As we know that this is the traditional TME approach where it's a top-down approach and you can see how we usually go by the TME plane, we must start from the top, uh, just like many of the speakers have already presented. And you continue to go down where the sacral curve starts to turn. And finally, it, it is really the last bit of uh, the TME that sometimes just, uh, you know, it could really make or break your day. That's the part that always makes the TME very challenging, especially if you have a male pelvis, narrow pelvis, and a very obese patient. And so that's where the bottom-up approach came about. And Really, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Uh, if when you do a bottom-up approach, you're looking direct from the bottom instead of uh, looking from the top down, and it, it gives you a lot of a lot more straight access. It also gives you a lot more, I would say, maneuverability. Although the initial part may be very narrow, but as uh, most people who have seen TATME surgery would be, as the surgery continues, it actually gets easier and easier because you get more space. And I think in the deep pelvis, that's what we are really talking about. Space is basically our biggest currency. If we have more space, we will find that the TME, regardless of whichever method, and really it's not about the method, but if you have the space, you probably will get a good job out of it. And so I think the TA TME concept really flourish uh, amidst the, uh, the difficult times. So the surgical anatomy is complicated. Because for most of us, we do not recognize these two main muscles uh, when we see from the top. The rectal urethral muscle as well as the rectal coccygeal muscle. And indeed, it, uh, it is because of uh, multiple uh, surgeons have ventured into this area first that we start to learn about the anatomy. Where when we go from the bottom up, we need to recognize these two landmarks for us to get access into the TME plane. And we need to be very cautious because if we do not 
uh, recognize these landmarks, we get lost, we will inevitably enter the seminal vesicle, the prostate, or even the ureter has been reported before. So how we do it? Well, we've done it only for about a few years, uh, since about 2015 or so. And uh, this is how we sort of standardize do it. There are many very platforms, but we have settled for gel point pair because of the fact that it is just more maneuverable. And of course, the latest gel point pair comes with a bag, which takes away the need for an air seal, which we still use. It is really a good way of uh, evacuating the smoke to allow you to have good visualization. And we do it mainly by a two team setup now. We do not do by a single team uh, because this is just, it saves more time and it allows us also, for most of us, uh, when we are still on learning curve, we will appreciate the time to slowly venture and explore the space that we need to do the surgery. So a two team setup really takes the stress off the bottom team when they just started doing. So I only have two main tips. I mean, there are many, many good tips out there and really uh, many distinguished invited speakers that we made friends with like Ito, like Peter Chen, even Parvit, who is one of the panelists, is a good friend. I've given a lot of, a lot of tips about how to do a good TATME. I think the two main focus uh, for the tips today is really about one, about the purse string. We start to know after about a decade of experience, really the purse string, I think is very crucial, especially if you deal with the controversy of local recurrence. Without a good purse string, it is a possible cause or rationale for why you do see some increased local recurrence in places where, like in the Dutch countries, in the Hollands, as well as uh, other countries where they start to report more and more abnormal recurrences in the pelvic, in the pelvis area after TATME. So uh, I've also changed ever since uh, when I started doing this. Now I try to do double purse string. Uh, again, this now is relative because this is all before COVID time. Uh, and double purse string just allows me to feel more secure. And I don't see the break in the purse string after COVID. The second tip is when it comes to recognition of plane, I, I find that the very important landmark for me, other than the two uh, uh, muscles that we've mentioned just now, is that we have to recognize what is known as the longitudinal muscles. This diagram is uh, courtesy of, uh, from uh, Ito, a good friend from Japan. You can see that those radial lines really reflect the different longitudinal muscles. And when you see it from a TATA perspective, after you've done the mucosa and submucosa and the initial incision, recognizing the longitudinal muscles becomes an important area because they are the next layer before we encounter the TME. Sometimes when we fail to recognize this line, we actually dissect too close to the TME and thereby compromise oncology. So I will give some videos on uh, uh, our first string about steps of TATME. This is our first video. Uh, it's basically about how we do the purse string and how we start doing the surgery by the mucosa incision. So normally we put in a lone star in the perineum, as you can see. The lone star will be used to basically uh, help us to uh, open the excess for us to put the pot. And clearly, after this step, we need to do a bit of an inner dilatation. We actually use the gel point path device. You can see the obturator actually fits in very smoothly and nicely. And with that, then we can gently introduce the gel point platform. The gel point platform does need to sit nicely above the anal rectal junction before you could start the surgery. In fact, if this part is not done well, uh, it doesn't allow for a good pneumorectum. And that may actually lead to uh, a problem in the section later part in the surgery. Okay, so after we have done that, essentially then we'll continue to get ready to put the platform in and start the pneumo. Uh, this step is crucial as well, uh, doing a copious washout of the rectum because uh, this also decreases the chance of having any micro seeding that is remnant, remnant in the rectum before you start the dissection. So once you're ready and you put in the pot, uh, now what we're getting ready to do is to start the pneumo rectum. Prior to this step, in the top team, if you have an abdominal team, they need to basically occlude the lumen of the rectum first, either via a way of a, a, a bowel handle, a bowel clip, or the other way is what I've seen some other people do is that they actually put a nylon tape around to tie off the rectum. 
again, by maintaining a good uh, rectal closure, then you can have a stable pneumorectum. As you can see, now it's not stable. So what I do personally is that I put in a gauze uh, and then after that, I allow the pneumorectum to stabilize first before I start the marking of the mucosa. So you can see now the rectum is a little bit more stable and then I will go on to mark the mucosa. So I do a, a circumferential mark on the mucosa first before I actually do my first string stitch. And the reason for that is that uh, if we're not careful, we tend to spiral the, the first string stitch, which again, it will lead to a very unequal TME. Uh, as uh, some critics have said, uh, TA TME may not be a true TME. I think this highlights the fact that if you want to do a good TME, you really need to make sure that your mucosa or your uh, per string stitch is at the same level and when you enter the plane you can then make sure they enter in a horizontal kind of plane for the TME. So as you can see the per string stitch is very important. It's very important not to miss any interval intervening uh, rectum. So I do overlap my stitches a little bit to make sure that I catch a good uh, submucosa all around because if you don't do that again you lead you lead to defects of the first string and that may actually lead to spillage of tumor cells. So very quickly, as you can see, once the whole first string stitch is done, usually just before I pull out to, to tie the knot, I do a little test. So I pull the whole first string stitch. So I, I overlap my last two stitches and then I'll do a little tuck on the first string to make sure that the whole mucosa comes in nicely before I enclose the first string, yeah. So I'll hop on to later part, which is now the start of the mucosa incision. So once the first string stitch is done, again, I mark a full circle around the first string. It's important that we do not mark too close to the folds of the first string. If not, we may actually encounter the first string stitch itself, and then the whole thing will break open. And unfortunately, in my experience, that has happened to me once. And so uh, again, I think that uh, double per string in that case also helps to mitigate that risk. So really the mucosa incision is supposed to go all around. And remember the slide I shared earlier about the longitudinal muscle. It is to get ourselves into the plane where we can safely see the longitudinal muscle all around before we move on to the next step. Okay, so I'll go on to the next step now. So now it is how do we enter the plane in different parts of the TME? Well, this is how I developed the anterior plane. Uh, I, I do realize that uh, some of my images are a bit blur because what happens is that I, I too, like the robotic surgeon, <laughs> we use a 3D system. And I find that uh, the 3D system, it only records one eye. So this one, I apologize a bit of the quality. But if you can see how the tension lines are important for developing the TME plane anteriorly. You see, when, when I pull on the rectum, the, the radial lines actually forms. This is after the longitudinal muscles have all been incised. And you can then safely see where is the anterior wall. In this case, this is the vagina. And you have to cut basically quite close to the vagina, but you stay on the basically the mesorectal side. Of the incision. And you do notice that there are always these small blood vessels and that is like the demarcation of where the vagina wall is. And so I try to stay medial to the small vessels as you can see as I dissect more and more vessels appear. And so I leave those small vessels on the vagina side so that I do not enter the vagina by mistake. Okay. Now, when it comes to the posterior TME plane, we heard about the triangles versus the circles. Again, you can see at this area, it seems like there are two types of fat. But by paying close attention to the, when you, the pneumo, the section actually allows us to see the difference between which plane to go. So as I pull on the rectum anteriorly, I think it is important that as we dissect, we try not to make any circles. We try to make sure that, that there's a continuous triangular tension line that points towards the mesorectum. 
again, as you continue to see this video, there will be a part where a circle starts to form. And when a circle forms, then I stay medial to the circle so that I do not enter, in this case, the pre-sacral fat uh, inevitably. You see, that's like a circle, which is different from the rest of the dissection. And by staying on the correct plane, you will find that we can continue to find the hairline dissection, which really, uh, mind you, this is the distal part of the rectum. Uh, just like shared by the previous speaker is that the visualization, I think for most of us who venture into whether it is robotic or laparoscopic, it is about the visualization advantage that gives us on the various platforms. I find that this visualization of the distal rectal TME is the best. Okay, I may not have time to finish all videos, but I will just do a bit of the lecture dissection on this particular video. Again, this is where the longitudinal muscles are being cut right now. You could recognize the longitudinal muscles basically uh, from the earlier diagram. You see I'm cutting them now. And once you dissect the longitudinal muscles, you will expect to come into the TME plane. So, Similar to the anterior and posterior approach, the tension is very important. Uh, as long as we can maintain the tension lines, we will be able to find the correct plane. And it is also very important to maintain meticulous hemostasis because we are operating on a very narrow space. Any spillage of blood or bleeder will, uh, will easily blind the field and then you can easily get lost. So, I started a bit more from the lateral for this case and I went back to the anterior and then I will go back down to the anterior lateral and then after that, I go down further. So I think this point is really to emphasize the fact that we have to find the right plane. We have to be very meticulous in doing this surgical technique so that we can maintain uh, the actual dissection along the TME plane. Uh, I think I showed posteriorly already. Uh, let me see whether I... Well, this one is a, a, a male pelvis. You can see the prostate is in front. Okay, I will just show the... Okay. So, prior to entering the posterior plane, there's always a fiber, which you mentioned about the muscle. See, the thickened fiber in this video is basically the rectal coccygeus muscle. And once you take that fiber off and with traction, you start to see the glistering TME fascia. And again, it allows you then to get into the TME plane as we described earlier. Yeah. Okay. Finally, the ideal visualization, uh, as we would see, is that we must be able to see the T TME plane all around, including the lateral side. So this is just a cut video of uh, another patient. And you can see the rectum is already more or less dissected to the left. And basically, this is the TME plane on the lateral wall. And you can see the whole surgery can be done essentially in a relatively bloodless view. Okay, I shall move on to our presentation. So, well, now that we've shown some pretty easy cases and honestly, I think that uh, there are always hard cases that will come by. And uh, just like when we have a male an obese pelvis, pretty much like a patient with a low rectal cancer. And if you measure the interpubic uh, distance as well as the rectal maximum diameter, you will find that it is pretty much almost entirely occupying the space. And in this kind of cases, where it's also very close to the anterior prostate, what do you do? And can we actually still do the same surgery? Well, I, I would say that by the principles of the surgery, we probably should be able to still get a reasonable TME plane, 
but it's not going to be as pretty as we will think it to be. So the question I always ask myself in this kind of cases is, well, if the technique does not help me in managing difficult cases, then where is my backup plan? In this case, I don't think I need to insist in finishing the surgery purely by TATME. As you can see, the prostate is severely stuck to the anterior part of the rectum. So the top part team, the top team for my, my side actually did a mini laparotomy in the lower part of the abdomen and they put a hand in and they guide my dissection from below. And then you will ask, then why do I still want to continue doing it TATME? Why not just do it open? I think it's back to the same point. If, if we were to imagine us doing this kind of cases open, you can see already the pelvis is narrow. You probably won't be able to visualize the plane. So all we could mainly do is to maintain a continual upward traction, which I have in this case by having my assistant putting a finger and then putting an instrument. But I have the additional advantage of visualization of the plane between the prostate and the rectum. And that really allows me, or rather it makes me feel that I am doing a dissection that's probably safer uh, than what I would do in a typical open case where I know I will probably mainly go by uh, mainly few and I would probably uh, err on the side of caution by taking a little bit more than I need to if I do it in the open fashion. So you see with that traction in the center where I managed to make a window between the prostate and the rectum, I continue from both sides, the left and the right and se separate it mainly from the rectum from the prostate thereby ensuring that I got a clear and clean TME plane anteriorly. Maybe just to show you towards the end, after the specimen is removed, you can see the entire prostate is a big prostate and it's bulging, but you can see more or less that it is still more or less intact and it is a clean plane that we've dissected the, the rectum from. So that is in terms of case selection and global uh, local adversity. But what about global adversity? I think I've come to the main uh, adversity that I would say, if you talk about TATME, what are we up against? The main question is, is it safe? And we know there are many publications and of the recent year from 2019 until now, we've already known the evolution of TATME has gone through a few, uh, I would say a few, uh, problems. Number one, we know that there is a higher risk of local recurrence in uh, Norwegian countries and that their time to recurrence is also very short. It's surprisingly 11 months. They also observe a very different side wall recurrence pattern, which is unseen even before uh, where we started TATME. So robotic, laparoscopic, they don't really see this kind of pattern. The expert opinion in those cases was that learning curve is real and they also hypothesized that the purse string leakage is probably one of the causes, as we alluded earlier. Just this year, there was an international expert consensus meeting to talk about the quality and implementation measures. And really, it was not easy for them to come to consensus about is it really that safe and what constitutes safe? But of all the different guidelines that they publish, uh, I would say that this one is pretty interesting to me because it's almost all of them agree that for a surgeon to operate or start on TATME, you need to have at least two GI specialists around. You need to have one which is really trained in TNTA who has overcame the learning curve and has to have experience in intersphincteric dissection. The contribution to a TNTA training uh, is preferable. That means that he must be a person who's recognized to be a trainer in TATME. I find that that sits more or less uh, matches our practice in Singapore, that we usually have one TATME trained surgeon, one who is on his learning curve to do it together, and that person is a senior surgeon himself. Because sometimes during difficult situations, much, much like the prostate one that I shared earlier, where there's a, a, a conflict in whether should we proceed or not to do, the discussion of opinions does help to put the patient's best interest at heart. So how do we overcome? I mentioned about how do we talk about 
overcoming adversity. I feel that these are the few guide, guideline principles that we use. And later I'll give you an acronym, we call it SAFE, so that we can overcome adversity safely. I feel that number one TATM is not for every patient. Selection is very important. Studies like this have shown that there are certain criteria that if you include large tumors and you have patients who have extramural venous invasion, you're going to high, have a higher CRM positivity. And clearly, we already know from a lot of evidence, historical data, CRM positive is associated with negative oncological outcome. TATME is also not for every surgeon. The audit of data is very important. I, I won't uh, delve more on my data. I have published, uh, I've talked about data before and we managed to publish a a smallish study uh, just this year to talk about old data. Thankfully, our local recurrence rate was not like what was reported in the Norwegian countries. But it is very important because if without data, you do not know whether you are actually matching uh, what is acceptable out there for your patients. The TATME learning curve is real. The importance of training of awareness of limitations are real. As surgeons, I think it's a, it's a general statement uh, very much like uh, reminded by our senior surgeons in the panel that yes, we, we, we as surgeons, when we see a negative outcome or complication, we feel like we have to change something. Easily, it leads to a bias of judgment. We need objective evidence and we need to understand what are our limitations so that we know what is the impetus of change. I feel that uh, uh, Dr. Chang's uh, 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 surgery was beautiful. And you could notice that in his surgery, it's all, he's the only one, his video was actually on the normal speed, whereas most of us had to double our speed for our videos. Because you can see experience counts a lot. He's very comfortable. He's doing a beautiful surgery. I would have no qualms about doing an open TME in, in that situation as well. So I think we need to be aware of our own limitations and we cannot just be based on other people's evidence and we might not be able to judge fairly about other people's work just by looking at other people's evidence. So these are the safe principles. I've covered the selection. I think that uh, if you look at the data out there, start with lesions that say 6 to 10 cm from the inner verge will be good. Not those with T4 and EVI, EMVI. Audit and governance is important. Differences do exist, but not all the data can be inferred out there. We have to have our own data and we have to have a consent and open discussion with the patients that we put them through any type of surgery, not just TATME. Formal training is definitely needed. Before we start on any new procedure, uh, just like uh, uh, the robotic surgery, our third speaker, uh, it's a lot of effort. I also feel that there was a lot of effort for me. In fact, to today, I still do robotic surgery as much as uh, TATME, and I find that uh, both surgery have their challenges and their learning curves. And it's needed that we need to have formal training and mounting on learning curves so that we can overcome the technical pitfalls. Last but not least is external collaboration. I find that uh, having external collaboration really helps a lot in our own learning journey. Uh, thankfully, uh, Color Tree trial has not booted me out of it yet. I say that because uh, my first few videos that I submitted, it was really, I was trying to submit some of my videos that was in my learning curve and they gave me very good comments. And they said that those videos were not up to the standard. Just like the purse string that I have a leakage case, that was one of the cases they said that that shouldn't be the case, the standard for TATME. And from there I learned. And I really thank, uh, I really thank God for this kind of learning opportunities. Because as a consultant surgeon, a lot of times we don't get much uh, feedback on audit by our other peers and our senior colleagues. So with that, I think I'll just end off by talking about the COVID situation. There is a definitely another global adversity amongst our meets. And what has COVID led to in terms of the TA, TME? It has led to challenges in continuing to do uh, not just TA, TME, but laparoscopic uh, surgery in general. So the safety of aerosolization uh, is a question, but as long as uh, you have a patient where it's a suspect case of COVID in Singapore, we will think twice before we do a laparoscopic surgery. And if we do, we will follow ESG guidelines. Segregation has led to impact on two team manpower because of the fact that we cannot mix teams. So doing two team surgery is much more difficult in this COVID period. There's also the stopping of trials. So even though we are part of the Kyler 3 trial, we are not allowed to continue recruitment for trials. They are non-essential at this point in time because 
it might just lead to a crunch in a bit crunch and a shortage of limitations of bids in Singapore. So clearly all that lead to a caseload impact. Well, then what do we do? I, I, I will tell you that uh, this is something that we are, I'm doing now. Uh, I have a team of uh, people who are together with me in the assistant dean office, in the dean's office where we look at COVID impact and its world. And this is one of the cartoons that come from there where low risk isn't no risk. It's an interesting thing that we know that we have to deal with changes and all of us are adapting to changes. Certainly, I myself have uh, changed somewhat uh, during this period of time. I also feel that uh, I need to keep the uh, surgical experience of TAT warm, but still, it is not at a compromise of safety for not just my patient, but the population at large. So with that, I hope to just end off the slide. I hope to see you all in uh, actual conferences. I don't know whether JDDW this year will be uh, cancelled, but if it's not cancelled, I will be there. If not, perhaps it will be another webinar where I'll see you all online. Again, thank you all for the invite and see you all online till then. Okay. Thank you for that wonderful sir. Now we come to uh, our panelists. We have invited two panelists, one local panelist that we have uh, that will give a short message from all the lecturers lecture, lecture that have, we have heard. The first is Dr. Carlo Cajupo, director colon and department of surgery, Jose Reyes Memorial Medical Center, a program director of one of the training uh, program of colorectal, uh, colorectal surgery in Quirino Memorial Medical Center, and the vice president of the Philippine Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons. Dr. Carlo? Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, indeed, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be speaking uh, in behalf of the society as a member of the panelists. And I would like to thank and congratulate all the speakers for all their uh, excellent talks. And also, I'd like to thank and congratulate all those who are participating. I've seen lots of uh, international guests and uh, friends. Most of them are friends. Uh, again, congratulations. Uh, it's indeed a great opportunity for us to share. Now, <clears throat> I will just share a personal uh, reaction and probably a perspective from a contextual point of view. Uh, I have been through all these uh, different approaches, most of which are the open and uh, laparoscopic surgeries, robotic surgeries, uh, not as a console surgeon, uh, and lately uh, via TAT and E. And probably for the past three to five years, we've been seeing uh, these different approaches being put into a battle of some sort as a debate, so which one is better. And uh, of course, the proponents are there to campaign and to put controversy to the unique advantages and disadvantages of the different approaches. So uh, I think I'll just share some of the data and evidence which we should always uh, consider. But uh, having uh, uh, looking at this evidence, I think this uh, is also the cause of some of the adversities or the hardships and the difficulties. This is where it starts. You know what great minds will tell us that uh, for every known truth, there is an equal and opposite truth. Now let me give you an example. Uh, it cannot be denied that TME or total mesorectal excision is the most significant innovation for rectal cancer surgery. We also know that it has been opposed during the 80s, but nevertheless, it's the gold standard in rectal cancer surgery. However, the range of its oncological safety and its application is again put into a controversial light. When we look at the literature, multi-center large scale randomized controlled trials for laparoscopic rectal surgeries, for example, the MRC Classic or the Color 2 and the Korean trials, we have seen that there's no difference in local recurrence and long-term outcomes, which includes also the disease-free survival. So there's no difference between the open and laparoscopic surgery, thus uh, recommending it to be a safe uh, alternative for uh, open surgery. However, as Dr. Chang placed it uh, earlier, uh, unfortunately, uh, the surgical community was stunned and was surprised with the release of the ACOSOG Z6051 and the ALOCAR trial. 
because uh, the non-inferiority uh, was not established for laparoscopic rectal uh, cancer surgery. And that uh, this is uh, based on statistical analysis for short-term oncologic outcomes like the quality of TME and the CRM or the circumferential radial margin. Now, of course, we did release the, uh, we expect a more and solid evidence for the safety of laparoscopic surgery when uh, the long-term outcomes for survival, recurrence uh, will eventually come out. So we're awaiting for the uh, results of these trials. Looking also at the meta-analysis for laparoscopic rectal uh, surgeries, uh, even if the differences within those trials were adjusted to obtain more reliable evidence, uh, they could still come up with the recommendation that lap laparoscopic rectal surgeries or sections should be carefully and selectively be done and with suggestions that it should be done by expert laparoscopic surgeons. For the robotic platform, I can say that it also has its uh, negative sides when we look at the literature, even if uh, it, is, uh, it has the advantage of a sophisticated operation, for difficult pelvic surgeries, when we try to interpret or some in, interprets it as uh, something that does not confer advantage with respect to TM equality with laparoscopic surgery. And of course, there's still no cost benefit analysis being done. Now for TATME, uh, of course it, is, it was developed to overcome the specific technical difficulties through uh, enhanced visualization and dissection planes. I believe with uh, uh, Chun Seng, uh, I remember that uh, my first uh, TATME cadaver exposure was with him in uh, NUH. Uh, however, uh, it is not still standardized and uh, however, the indications are expanding and are deemed to be feasible and safe. Now, looking at all of these uh, multi-center trials and the different meta-analyses, uh, I think uh, one point I would like to deliver is that quoting results from multi-center RCTs serves poorly as an evidence-based surgery. Uh, true evidence-based surgery can only be achieved when one or when each surgeon recognizes his own results and is really able to advise his patients accordingly. If we will just be quoting others' results and uh, going through all this literature, this will negate the achievements of what a master surgeon should be. And uh, we should remember uh, that only a particular surgeon or a particular environment with a particular patient can decide. Uh, bottom line, there's no controversy, there's no debate whether this is open, laparoscopic, robotic, or TA. Remember, all of them has, have those the term TME. So we, we have to still remember that the gold standard is total mesorectal excision, whatever approach uh, we perform. Uh, and it is not just a, a surgical technique or a surgical skill. It is an idea that has principles and of course considerations for preoperative diagnosis, patient selection, uh, pathology report, uh, multidisciplinary team discussions, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. So it is a concept all in all, a principled concept. So I think uh, the uh, theme for this webinar uh, says it all. So it is the main and for the foremost important uh, thing to consider when dealing with rectal cancer surgery. And that is maintaining quality even uh, with adversity and even with difficulties. And that is to perform total mesorectal excision. That would be all, so thank you. Back to you, Dr. Mike. Thank you. Of another panelist, we're very privileged to have with us another panelist from Thailand, Dr. Pawe Chotharat. Uh, from Maharaj Nakurung Nar in Thailand. Dr. Pavit. Okay, yes. Thank you, Michael. Uh, first, do you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, Please thank you. Uh, okay. 
First of all, I would like to thank the PSEIS committee for inviting me to join with a uh, great conference. To me, sir, experts and a famous correct uh, surgeon in the uh, Philippines and uh, Singapore, Professor Robert Chang, Professor Mario Francisco, Professor Monroy, and uh, Professor Chun Chun Seng. Today we have uh, four lectures about the TME. Start with uh, Professor Robert Chang. Very, uh, I'm very appreciative in uh, uh, his lectures. Uh, he talked about the standard TME, standardized TME, so about the concept, hypothesis, and uh, operative objectives, and show the wonderful videos that uh, I'm very appreciative in your video from the 2004. And uh, you must recognize that's about uh, another one about our TME specimen is very important. So, uh, and I think that after we completed the open TMEs, the pathologics can help us to uh, check yeah, the specimen that's good or not. And the second reaction is about the lab TME by Professor Francisco. I remember that I met a professor in the year 2011 in the AETF 11 in Shanghai. Very good friends. So he talked about the history of the lab TMEs, the Philippine experience in treatments of the rectal cancers and the uh, concept of the laparoscopic TME and the uh, open TME is the same to keep the good oncologic outcome. And he shows some of the limitations of the lab TMEs. And for the robotics, robotic surgeries by Professor Monroy, uh, first I would like to uh, congratulate to you and uh, Philippine General Hospital to have the new robotic systems. Your video is very nice, and I think uh, in the future you can do much and more the robotic for erectile cancers. And the last, the last topics, two things: very best friend from Singapore about the TATME. Two things: give me the principle and the concept of the TATMEs, and uh, show the important points that. Uh, we must to recognize when perform the TA TMEs that are first thing technique and for to protect the tumor cell spillage. I think I agree with uh, to saying to make a double passing techniques to to make sure that there no spillage of some tumor cell or content from the rectum and and for me I think. All of the techniques is very important, including open surgery, laparoscopics, or robotics, or TATMEs. I think for coronal surgeon, I think we should learn. We should learn all of them that uh, in some situation, it can help us. For example, if you uh, perform the laparoscopic TMEs, in some cases, it's very difficult. If you convert conversion to open surgery, it means maybe it's more difficult. I think the TADME can help you convert, not conversion to open TMEs, but a conversion to TADME. In the robotic surgery, it's the same. And in some cases, with the open surgery, it's very difficult. If you perform the open surgery, you can combine with the TATME, the two team is the same as video that uh, Professor Chin Seng show us. So I think for, for me, uh, we should learn, we should learn and <coughs> to find the ways that the proper treatment for, the, for our patients, open lab robotics or TATMEs. Thank you very much for very nice lecture for for speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pawe. Now, if we have some questions being asked by our fellows uh, through the chat and question answer for question and answer box. Uh, I have some unanswered questions. Uh, 
specifically addressed to one of our speakers and the panelists can also comment in this uh, questions. Shall we start? Uh, the first question uh, addressed to Dr. Chang, Dr. Robert. Uh, given your vast experience, have you discovered a better technique for colorectal anastomosis after you move away from holoplasties? A, do you have a preference, an end-to-end, -end, a side-to-end, or a particular technique? Uh, I've done away with uh, coloplasties and I'm back to the straight anastomosis. Uh, I, I find it uh, after I, I close my stomach uh, with a straight anastomosis, the bowel movement averages around six to eight per day with good control. Although I still have problem with anterior resection syndrome, but the number of bowel movements to me is quite okay and the patients are quite happy. So I'm back to the straight anastomosis. Dr. Chang, as a follow-up, do you have any do you have any factors that you have to evaluate when you can do a straight or a straight to uh, with a doing a straight end to end or a pouch, for example, an age or a stage of your patients? Uh, well, as I said, I've gone back to to straight anastomosis, but I do have uh, more a stricter selection criteria for doing intersphincteric resection. I, I try to avoid doing intersphincteric resections for elderly females, especially those who have multiple childbirth to the vagina. So expectedly, the, the sphincters will be poorer and the functional outcome will be much worse. So my selection process will be based on more of if I'm going to do intersphincteric resection. Can we hear from other speakers, Dr. Rami and Dr. Donning and Dr. Chong, regards to anastomosis, doing your technique, uh, laparoscopic robotics and KTME? Shall we start with Dr. Rojas? Most of the time, uh, I, I do a straight. Uh, end to end anastomosis um, but if you can uh, sometimes uh, there are two situations where I end up doing either a, a J pouch or a side to end uh, one is sometimes you can predict which patients may have a little more difficulty with the uh, anterior resection syndrome and you can predict that already preoperatively usually males who are already having some difficulty and then, and then they still don't want a permanent stoma. So in those situations, I, I sometimes put a part of them. Having said that, it's not easy to see. Well, they have difficulty anyway, post-operatively. Um, and then once in a while with an easy case, uh, and you know that uh, the data seems to support it, it's good to show your residents how it's done uh, or your, your fellow once in a while. And I think uh, in those situations, uh, Mobilization has been good, uh, easy to stapler, easy to operate, and uh, and so I, I, I either end up doing the, the pouch or the uh, or the side to end, uh, uh, which makes them happy to see once in a while. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Rojas. Doctor Noning, Mike, uh, I do a straight anastomosis staple for all my LARs. And occasionally for my coloanal, I do J pouch, staple J pouch, coloanal anastomosis. I think there's also one question that's left unanswered with regards to LAR anastomosis. Uh, I think the question was if you do you do suturing or reinforcement of the anastomosis after an LAR. Occasionally I do that when I see that my staples are very visible and there's some potential weak points in the anastomosis after inspecting uh, the entire anastomosis. If you can do it, it's really the posterior part, you cannot uh, check, okay? Okay, so the reinforcement answer uh, Dr. Noning has mentioned it would be ill-weighted, the surgeons, if you seem to have a uh, weak anastomosis, then you can do reinforcement, but not a routine one. Okay. This might help with the 
to decrease the compromise of your vascularity in the anastomosis. Dr. Chong? Yes, hi. Yeah. Thank you. Anastomosis. Yeah. Very similar to all the other speakers, I do straight anastomosis for most of them. And a similar experience with uh, Dr. Robert Chang that uh, most of them are happy. So I end up not having to do pouches. I think only for IPAA, ILO uh, pouches, then I'm, I think then there will be a need for the pouch. And uh, the other thing is that anastomosis, I only do it if there is a bowel caliber mismatch. Like uh, sometimes uh, I have an unfortunate a need to do a emergency surgery for resections for obstructed cases. And the proximal bowel is very dilated. In those cases, there's a big bowel mismatch. Then I will do an end-to-site anastomosis. So I, I find that I only need to do an end-to-site in uh, cases where there's a bowel mismatch. Okay. Dr. Pawit? I, I do the same as uh, two things. Straight anastomosis. But uh, for for TA TME is a little bit a uh, little bit uh, different from another technique from the conventional laparoscopic or robotic surgeries that are in their TA TME they are in two ways one is a uh, hand-sew colloidal anatomosis another one is due to staple that divide three times for one is a uh, hemorrhoidal staple use or another one is abdominal the burn pressing technique another one is a uh, Try and not burn person technique. They are two type of the technique of the TATME is a little bit different from the uh, conventional lab or robotic surgeries. You mentioned on a uh, hemorrhoidal stapler, it's not uh, 33 yeah. mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, 33 mm. Yes, a little bit big. <laughs> Please uh, carefully when you use this, it maybe is a uh, easy to uh, injury to the organ surroundings, for example, vagina or prostate. Yeah. Okay, that's good to hear for our sponsors. Uh, yeah, Dr. Kahokum, you have any? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I, I may say that uh, it's an uh, evolution. Uh, the video that Dr. Chang showed was during our era when we were performing coloplasties and then we evolved to performing J pouches and then straight anastomosis. Uh, now that we have uh, uh, pelvic floor diagnostic tests and uh, we're uh, performing studies with regards to function, we are also looking at the new literature where uh, they say that the uh, side end to side is a better approach for functional uh, outcomes. So uh, I may say that uh, that's what we're performing more nowadays. Thank, Thank you. you uh, we still have time um, for a few questions. Uh, this is a question from one of the attendees in rectal cancer, locally advanced. Uh, how do you Evaluate the response. Uh, maybe he's uh, referring to a neoadjuvant treatment. How do you do? How do you evaluate response by endoscopy? Is CA level ultrasound uh, of the rectum, a PET scan, or MRI? Uh, can Dr. Trump? Me, Mike. Go ahead, Dr. Chang. Okay. Uh, if you if you look at the, the literature right now, especially uh, I'm sure the participants will be very familiar with NCCN. And if you look at the guidelines of NCCN, it's all MRI, it's all this and all that. And and for, for some of you guys who who live in places where in MRI is not available or you have to go to the next town to get an MRI, please do not feel embarrassed that you cannot manage rectal cancer, okay? You can maximize the resources that you have. If you have CT scan, you can do that, okay? So if you, I think that the key here is you need to reevaluate after new adjuvant treatment, 
But with what particular or with what specific instrument will depend on what is available in your locality and you maximize the available tools, okay? So if you say you, you only have a CT scan to evaluate, then step up and improve on your diagnostics, on your, on your reading capabilities of your CT scan, okay? So if you say follow NCCN to the letter, some of you would be very embarrassed to say, oh, we don't have MRI, therefore we cannot manage. It is not true, right? Now, we at Jose Reyes have not been using MRI as a routine and we don't feel embarrassed about it. Our results are quite good. And how did we overcome? By improving our skills in reading CT scan plates. It is not the most ideal, but it is what we have. Okay, so you have to make do with what we have. Remember, uh, I think there's a lesson that better learned no? uh, from I read somewhere from an economics uh, publication. The, the technologies that we have that works well for first world countries may not work well when we apply them to a situation such as ours. Okay, so we have to make do with whatever we have. And for surgeons, we have to step up, improve on your reading capabilities, improve your, on your technique if you want to improve your outcome. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Chang, uh, for that wonderful insight. I remember Dr. Chang telling me about the use of my finger aside from the CT scan. Um, any other ideas from the speakers, Dr. Rojas and Dr. Pawit, Dr. Kahukong? Um, hi, Mike. Um, you know, as, as we evolve in, in the management of rectal cancer and, and preoperative radiotherapy became the, the norm actually for stage two and stage three, uh, even the, the practice of re-imaging was something we had to uh, grow into uh, for, 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 well, in, in the government hospitals where we were doing open surgery, um, we would rely on our fingers more often and, and, and that, that. But uh, in this era where we want more precision surgery and you want to decide whether you're going to do it laparoscopic or robotic, whether there's going to be a complete response and, and, and how to manage the patient accordingly, then it, it's important to image them again. Um, and uh, even, even for, for advanced tumors, I, I always... And of course, with the right situation in terms of uh, support, I always get an image a week before surgery, two days before, uh, to plan out the surgery, see where in my decision I need to be a little more careful, um, what the approach uh, would best be. So yeah, I, I, I image them again, uh, preferably an MRI, but sometimes we make do with a CT scan. Uh, if I feel that the you know, if there's a there's a high likelihood of complete response on digital examination, then it would be good to, to scope them again and, and see. Dr. Chong, you have any additional insights, Pop? Um, I think largely similar. I think uh, clearly MRI staging is the preferred choice uh, for, for such cases. I mean, that again, it's our experience. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Pawit, thank you. Yes, MRIs. I always use MRIs before and I post CCRT and also chronoscopics and correct our examinations to be the same. Uh, Dr. Mike, Mike, yes. Yes. Mike make an additional comment. Yes, Paul. I, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Ramiro has, please help me with this. No? Uh, in a recent review that we, we, we did, no? that is where I'm talking about the, the Philippine setting. No? Uh, the MRI, number one, the quality of images that we are getting from the MRI are not the, the ideal images that we see. And number two, the MRI reports. That, that we, we receive, probably except for, for your, your hospital, Medical City, all the rest will be reporting MRI just like they were reporting CT scan. 
Okay, no mention of, of bowel wall involvement. So it would be left to the surgeon to interpret the results. But unfortunately, the, the images that we're getting are of poor quality. Perhaps our, our maybe the, 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 the younger members can, should get our head together and come up with a proposal or, or whatever that, that we, we, we share with the Philippine College of Radiology to improve the quality of our MRI. Because based on the MRI images that I'm getting, it's just as good as a CT scan. Dr. Rojas, any comment on that? Yes, Robert, that, yeah, that is correct. You really have to discuss uh, with, your, with your radiologist and walk them through what, what, what you need to see. And unfortunately, only a few of these uh, radiology departments uh, can that be done. Uh, and, and my experience also is the same. If, I, if my patient is going to get his MRI somewhere else, then uh, I'd rather he don't. He doesn't. Uh, because the readings and the, the plates don't look as, as, as nicely as they should. Uh, so, and that, that's the other advantage of a cheap CT scan. Sometimes it's, it's easier to read than, the, uh, than, a, than a bad MRI. So yeah, it does require. Um, however, uh, if your hospital is going to be a rectal cancer referral hospital, that discussion with radiology has to be done. Um, and it has to be done well, together with pathology, of course. Um, you know, there's some, there are few questions left, but with the interest of time, uh, I think there's a, a very relevant question preparation uh, method of T uh, or approach of the ATME versus laparoscopy or open can we hear from dr uh, dr Rojas Mike I'm sorry I didn't hear your question can you can you repeat it uh, in COVID era, where there is a fecal isolation of virus, uh, which is highly docu documented, uh, would you advocate bowel preparation if you do one or if you do in your patients? And uh, your method of approach in rectal uh, cancer patients, T uh, TATME, laparoscopy, or robotics, would it matter in this era of COVID pandemic? Well, I think generally during this COVID pandemic, uh, whether it's by a physician's choice or, or, or patient's choice, the, we've not seen a lot of elective uh, procedures um, and, uh, and mostly emergency. Now, uh, when it gets to aerosolization, well, there is a general risk and therefore wearing full PPEs um, is, is mandatory to, to do whether it's open or laparoscopic, I think it's the same. Uh, there is a fear that the laparoscopy might have uh, higher aerosolization. That still has to be proven. And there are already strategies and, and, and processes by which uh, this can be minimized by, by filters in the uh, ex exhaust uh, tubings as, as well as uh, uh, making sure that the, the gas doesn't leak out. I, I, I'm not too sure. I, I think there's a lot of question questioning now whether the risk is really that increased in laparoscopy, uh, the benefits. So I think a well-selected patient who is clear from COVID uh, by by early testing and then uh, uh, careful protection of the all the healthcare workers in the operating room, um, uh, we should be able to do laparoscopy also. Uh, well, as long as, uh, as I said, it's well planned and these are well selected patients. If the patient is surely COVID uh, positive, then uh, that that's a different story. And I, I have not operated on a COVID positive patient. I'm not sure how to answer that, but uh, whether it, I do it laparoscopic or open, I think these patients would really be in emergent uh, situation. And, uh, uh, and you need a short OR time. I choose an operation that. Uh, doesn't require general anesthesia so that your anesthesiologists are a little more 
safe uh, if I can do it uh, uh, regionally. I, I do it with regional anesthesia and then uh, do it quick. Uh, so everyone gets uh, less exposed. So perhaps in that situation, an open procedure might be the way to go. Can we hear from Dr. Chong and Dr. Powit for the last uh, comment on this question? Can we hear from your insights in your uh, countries, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think uh, for TATME, I will certainly not do the surgery if I have a patient with COVID positive. Uh, again, uh, I remember mentioning that uh, we should not risk uh, adversities in such situations, including the safety of the people who are operating. That means the team of the people. So once there's any doubt, I, I will choose not to. It's not the approach. As long as the patient gets a good TME, I think doing the safest is the best. So the second thing about the bowel prep, I, 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 I haven't really thought about that question. I'm so sorry. Uh, but we don't routinely bowel prep our patients as well. Perhaps if I'm really concerned, I would say that actually the evidence is that you may not need bowel prep in most patients because really the evidence for bowel prep and in terms of anastomotic leak and infection is really not there. In fact, it's a more negative than anything. So I would suggest not doing bowel prep if you're really concerned. Yeah. Thank you. Lastly, Dr. Pawit, before we end the question and answer. Uh -huh. In, in uh, our hospitals now, uh, the patient who have uh, cancers, we operation, but uh, uh, we admit the patients about four or five days before and it takes uh, history. The COVID test in uh, all patients who will operate, if uh, negative, we will go on. And if I have a risk of positive, we not operate now. And, and uh, for the system that they use, uh, for aposcopic, use the usual systems, not, not different. But uh, today, today, I think in uh, Chiang Mai, is no, no, no case now. And must uh, go on to uh, completely 100% for test the patient before admit and for the emergency case is uh, very difficult because of some time uh, we cannot uh, wait for the operation but uh, we just uh, take the history taking of the patient see if a patient have the risk we will go on the use the PPE for for surgeries but uh, if we can wait the the test for COVID we will wait before the surgeries okay Thank you so much, Dr. Powell. Thank you very much for your participation for all the attendees or the fellows, residents who are attending this webinar. Uh, for the Before we end, can we hear from a, uh, a word from our sponsor, uh, Medtronix, uh, from Rowen, Ma'am Rowena Orke. Hello, sir. Dr. Dr. May, can you hear me? Yes, you are. I am. Epo. Mm. Um, good afternoon again, dear doctors. Um, in behalf of Medtronic Philippines, headed by Sir Kirvin de la Cruz, uh, Mr. Eric Kison, and Sir Francis Lopez, and of course, from the PACE team, um, Professional Affairs and Clinical Education under the leadership of Ms. Linda Su, um, we would like to express our sincere gratitude for this partnership. Actually, it's a personal achievement for, for me, okay, in behalf of Medtronic to be part of this webinar. This is the first ever um, PSCRS webinar in this time of pandemic. So PSCRS is very close to my heart. And um, apart from the COVID products that we have, like we have our ventilators, our smoke evacuators, or our um, laryngoscopes and all, I think what is very relevant, what is very special for us is to provide an avenue for the doctors so that you can actually enhance the surgical skills of your um, uh, fellows, of your residents, and um, your colleagues. So we are providing this platform with the help of the Telemedicine Network of the Philippines under the wings of Dr. K. Panganiban, Dr. Kathy, and Dr. Jeff. Sir Alvin, thank you very much. This is actually our fifth 
the fifth seminar, um, fifth webinar, and we have five more to come. Okay, it's a partnership with the different national societies in the Philippines. So we we, we also believe that you know even though we have COVID, we have um, this pandemic the training, education, learning will always continue. So we support you. You have our full support, PSERS. And before, before I let you go, um, just um, deep uh, appreciation for the speakers. Um, of course, Dr. Um, Dr. Chang, Dr. Rojas, and Dr. Monroy, as mentioned by Dr. Um, Dr. Uh, Joboy Fuentes, our course director, they are the three pillars in TME. Um, thank you very much as well to doc, the president of PSCRS, Dr. Bobby Bandolon, the vice president, Dr. Carlo Cajucom, um, secretary, Dr. Omar Ocampo, and the treasurer, Dr. Andre. Of course, our renowned um, speakers from Singapore, Dr. Chong, and of course from Thailand, Dr. Pawit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Po. Um, um, I'm just giving two minutes, Po for our dear um, senior product specialist, if it's okay, Doctora. Um, Ms. Dada Sacramento will just discuss briefly. Two minutes only, two minutes pa. Hello, hello, good afternoon, doctors. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank again PSCRS for making Medtronic part of this very informative session. And thank you as well to all the speakers for all the wonderful insights. Um, would like to share lang to you, doctors, our complete stapling portfolio. Yeah, um, we have the endogia and the tri-staple for the laparoscopic surgeries. And we also have the circular, the linear stapler, and the linear cutter for your open surgeries. So, doctor, if you will have any more, more concerns or inquiries about staplers or other endomechanical devices, um, next slide, please, Weng. And you may reach me. Here's my mobile number. Feel free to reach me and my email number, uh, my email address if you have any concerns regarding the staplers or trocars or any other endomechanical. Uh, and again, thank you very much, PSARS, and to Telemed and to Dr. Ake. Thank you very much. Thank you, healthcare heroes. That's all. That's quick. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Sir, thank you for, for the who else organized and for the uh, office of PSRS. Thank you guys and thank you so much for all the attendance and the support. Uh, Bobby, do you have any announcement? Um, me? Okay. Um, yes. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you to all the speakers and international. Apawit and Chunseng and our foreign attendees. We have from Mexico, from the US, and in other parts of Asia as well. Um, please stay tuned. As again, I mentioned that the PR series will continue to provide uh, webinars, practical and uh, educational webinars for all. Uh, we will be sending links to all the Viber ac accounts, the Messenger accounts. So please stay tuned. Don't forget to uh, support us. And we'll all, always support you in your uh, journey in rectal, colon rectal surgery. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Bobby. As we thank God, our Almighty, for providing us this technology, we would like to end this webinar. Let me. Thank you. Thank you. Mabuhay, PSARS, Medtronic. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Bobby.